everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Buenas tardes. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Uh, my name is Emma Guest Gonzalez, and I'm the president of GANIC, the Guides Association of New York City. Welcome to our May meeting. I'm watching the numbers go up. I'm happy that people are coming. Um, I can't wait till we'll be able to see each other in person. But for now, this is this is what we've got. And I think we're all used to it. I've, over a year of Zoom meetings, it seems bonkers, but here we are. So welcome, welcome. I hope everyone is well. I um, hope you're enjoying some of the spring weather. We have May showers today. So we'll get started in just another minute or so when I see the numbers start to slow down a bit. And today's theme, of course, is Cinco de Mayo for our member meeting. We have a really interesting panel here tonight and we look forward to some, some great discussion and we're going to have some important updates for everyone from the board and from our committees. So I'll wait one more minute and then we'll get started. Okay. All right, so let's get going. So again, Welcome to the monthly GANIC meeting. My name is Emma Guest Gonzalez. I'm the president of the Guides Association of New York City. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for, uh, for attending. We have our agenda should be, um, I, it will be put into the chat in just a moment if you have not seen it yet. Um, but we've got a great meeting tonight and we have um, four very special guest speakers uh, coming to us uh, along with uh, our moderators, Kevin Lawrence and Georgina Castanon. So we're really looking forward to some great discussion. But before we get to that, um, I'd just like to uh, take a moment to say a few words to everybody. First of all, um, we're reopening, I guess, for business um, between Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo. I'm not quite sure of the exact date. They keep going back and forth, I think trying to one-up each other, but I know all of us, all our guides, are ready um, and waiting. Attractions are open, um, museums are open, our parks are, have never looked more beautiful, I don't think. And it's really, um, it's nice to see the spring and it's nice to see uh, our city coming back. And as, um, as I said at the, the news conference uh, last week, you know, this is going to be the summer of New York City. And we really are looking forward to welcoming visitors back. And we're looking forward to um, all our guides working a lot, whether you're still continuing to work virtually or whether you're going to start working in person. And so on that note, I'd like to remind everyone, please get your vaccines. Make sure you get your vaccine. Um, it's Now it's basically walk in anywhere to get it. They, we all know they're safe. We all know they're very, very effective. And uh, we all know they make a big, big difference. So get a vaccine. Um, don't be one of those, you know, Debbie Downers, oh, I'm not going to get it. Oh, I don't need it because I never get sick. You might not get sick, but you might get other people sick. So please, please, please make sure you get your vaccine. And we want everybody to be healthy. We want everybody to be safe. And we want to do that also because we want to start seeing everybody again. And uh, that is why the board at our last meeting, we discussed when eventually we'll be able to start having our meetings in person, not just Zoom, but we'll have meetings in person. We'll all get together. We'll all be in the same space together. And to do that, we'll, we really like everyone to have their vaccine. And we're hoping to do that for the, um, uh, the annual general meeting, which will be in September, okay? September 9th this year, we'll have our annual general meeting and we're looking for venues for that. And Mike Morgenthau will give us all an update, but we do want our first in-person meeting of the year to be our general meeting. And um, so we'll get more details on that, but something just to keep in mind. So save the date September 9th for our, our general meeting. Now, one thing about the city reopening and some of you are on social media and some of you are, are participating in various groups of people who ask, um, is anything happening in New York? What should I see in New York? And the conversation can get a little heated because there are always the naysayers who say, you should not be going to New York. It's terrible. You know, they seem, some parts of our country seem to think New York City burnt to the ground last summer and we're still, you know, living in the wreckage, you know, 
behind bars and quarantined and hidden and afraid. And that could be nothing further than um, the truth, so, from the truth. So uh, when you interact with people like that, remember, be polite. They could be potential clients. You know, don't, don't get, jump all over everyone, even though you may want to, and even though you may thinking in the back of your head that they're complete ignoramuses, but please, you know, be polite, be kind, be professional. And these are legit, legitimate fears for a lot of people. And I saw Michael Dillinger, as he said, don't feed the trolls. Don't let those people get on your nerves or upset you because we all love our city. That's why we're tour guides. And we all want people to come and we want people to enjoy themselves, but they need to feel safe. They need to feel comfortable coming here. And that's part of our job as ambassadors to New York City to be to be doing that. So I just want to remind you about that to, to keep um, to keep that professional. Now, tonight's meeting, we're going to have our wonderful speakers in just a moment, um, but we're going to first have an update from Mike Morgenthal about Guide Week, and, and then we'll also be having an industry partner vote tonight. And if you are a committee chair, just um, stay tuned because I will call you on to, um, uh, calling you to speak when it is your turn. But um, really, Again, I'd just like to say everybody welcome for coming to uh, and thank you for coming tonight. And uh, before actually, before we uh, um, turn it over to Mike, I would also like to, to say, um, to express our sincere, sincere condolences to um, our guests and for the tragedy that, um, that the tragic accident that happened in Mexico City. Um, we are also a city of you know, millions of people, lots of public transportation and those kinds of accidents. Really, I think all of us felt it very, very strongly and we express our sincere condolences and send all our prayers to the victims and to the survivors. And it's on behalf of myself, the board and our entire GANIC membership. So I just want to make sure to let you know that. And um, for now, um, I'll turn it over to Mike and we'll continue with our meeting. So thank you everybody, Mike. Give us an update. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. Appreciate it. And uh, hi, everybody. Hope everybody's enjoying the spring. And as we've seen in the comments, uh, the people are starting to get tour bookings. Uh, and that actually dovetails really nicely with the first time you're going to see me on camera tonight to talk about Guide Week, which is finally happening next week. And we are so excited to uh, bring this to you, not just to you, but to tour guides all around the world. So for those of you who aren't familiar, We've been developing this virtual event for, um, for a couple of months. Uh, and the idea is it's really the first virtual event solely designed for local tour guides. Um, if you've attended other travel events, you probably know that tour guides are sometimes an ancillary part of that. This, the focus is on tour guides themselves. So that's why we created it. And we've opened it up, not just to tour guides from New York and GANIC members, but people all over the world. And we've had uh, people sign up already from, in addition to New York and around the US, we have registrants from Portugal and from Slovenia and from Japan and from the Philippines and probably some other places that I'm skipping right now. So it's gonna be a really fun and exciting event. So I just wanna run through a couple of points with you guys. Sorry if this takes a, a few minutes, but uh, I think it's important to kind of get all the details out as we're getting really close to what to the event. So um, first of all, a huge thank you to uh, GANIC member and industry partner, Mitch Bach, and also to Nikki Padilla, who have really been the driving forces behind getting this off the ground. There's been another army of volunteers uh, behind them as well. But uh, Nikki, Mitch, and myself have really been uh, grinding to get this all uh, ready and good to go. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy uh, yourselves uh, for the week next week. Now, it is not too late to register. Um, I would recommend registering uh, in the next couple of days though. Obviously the panels start Monday. Uh, cost is $20 for GANIC members, $30 for any tour guides who are members of their own local tour guide association and $40 for everybody else in the world, whether you're a tour guide or not. Uh, and you get a lot for your money. And I just wanna run through kind of what we're, we're offering to you guys. So. Uh, Monday, May 10th and Tuesday, May 11th will be the educational sessions. Everything is going to take place on a platform called Campfire, which Mitch has actually built. You don't have to worry about that. All you have to do is click on the link that you get when you registered or uh, a, a reminder email went out today and there'll be several more between uh, today and Monday uh, with that link 
just bookmark that link and it will take you to the uh, main platform, uh, the main landing page for registrants. And I just want to share my screen to show you what it looks like. So let me just get the right. Okay, can you guys all see my screen? Okay, cool. Yeah, we can see it fine, Mike. Thank you. Great. So when you register, uh, this will be the main uh, page, and this is where the sessions will also take place. Uh, so let me just kind of run down the elements here. So if you have not registered, you won't see this. You go to guideweek.org and register, and then you'll have access to this. But um, let me start with the educational event. So tomorrow, for attendees, we're going to unveil the complete schedule, although on guideweek.org, you can actually look at which day which panels are taking place. But tomorrow, we're going to unveil uh, the time of all of those panels. So. We have uh, 10 different sessions, plus a keynote by a uh, keynote conversation with Avita Turquoise Robinson, a truly inspiring figure in the travel world who founded the No Madness Travel Tribe to, uh, to cater to um, uh, people of color uh, who like to travel. And uh, she has over 25,000 followers. She's really a, an inspiration and she's super excited to talk to us. So I hope everybody will tune in for that. By the way, one quick thing on both May 10th and May 11th, we do start the event at 10 a.m. Eastern time, but at 9.30, we're offering kind of like a warm up and appetizer. One of our premier sponsors, Travel Curious, is providing um, virtual uh, live stream tours uh, at 9.30, both Monday and Tuesday. One day is gonna be Lima, Peru. One day is gonna be Moscow. I have to be honest with you, I don't know which day is which, but more information on that is coming. Uh, then our wonderful president, Emma Guest Gonzalez, is going to be the MC of the event. Uh, she'll offer a few opening remarks, and then we'll go right into the keynote address. On May 11th, there's going to be a secondary keynote address, which is called Coffee Talk with Gannick, where many of the people you see on the meeting tonight will actually discuss what their committees do and what you can get out of uh, by being a member of Gannick, uh, whether you're already a member or thinking of joining as a member. And the idea is for those tuning in from outside of New York City, perhaps it'll inspire uh, them to come up with some creative ideas for their own personal uh, tour guide associations. And then after that, the two uh, sessions, basically the main sessions will run from 11 to three each day. These times are all Eastern and uh, five sessions each day. Some of them will be split sessions. Some of them will be single sessions where everybody's in the same session, but don't worry. Uh, everything's being recorded on the educational side. So if you are in one session, you'll have a chance to review the other session. Or if you're busy next week, if you're leading tours, but you still wanna see what's going on, um, it's all gonna be recorded. If you register, you'll have access to the recordings uh, after the event is uh, completed. So that's really, really exciting. And that's kind of the core of Guide Week. And we really tried to set up these, um, these sessions and seminars to uh, set everybody up for success as we come out of kind of this COVID forced hiatus um, and are starting to get out there and do tours again. So check out guideweek.org for the list of panels and panelists. And like I said, if you are registered tomorrow, the full schedule with times and everything will be unveiled. Uh, also being unveiled tomorrow are virtual tours. We have curated an amazing list of virtual tours for uh, you all to um, to attend. It's included in the cost of registration. So just uh, to let you know, uh, the schedule will be unveiled tomorrow, as will be instructions for registering for these virtual tours. We're offering tours Monday and Tuesday after the educational sessions end, and Wednesday and Thursday throughout the day. And I believe that all of them start at separate times. So if you want to spend the whole week taking virtual tours around the world, 20 bucks for Gannick members, 30 and 40 for everybody else. It is definitely worth it. Uh, one quick note, um, the registration for the uh, virtual tours uh, is being handled strictly by these guides and tour operators. We, uh, once you sign up for a tour, we don't have anything to do with it. So please, if you sign up for something and you have to cancel, do it through their platform, whatever instructions they give you when you register. And uh, as a corollary to that, just like with organic events, uh, some of these events will have limited capacity, even though they're virtual events. So please only sign up if you are sure you can attend. The virtual tours will not 
be recorded. They must be viewed in real time when they are scheduled. All of the guides are donating their time and their services to us. So if you are able to do so, please be generous by offering them a gratuity at the end of their tours. Um, let me see, was there anything else on virtual tours? Uh, no, I think that's it on virtual tours. Uh, and then last but not least, probably the thing that most people are curious about is Friday, May 14th, recruitment day. So uh, you can see the timing here is from 10 to five. We actually are gonna have an appetizer virtual tour uh, a little bit closer to home. Uh, our dear organic member, Beth Goff, is gonna be offering a live stream virtual tour at 9.30 in the morning of the Northern Forts of Central Park, a, a tour she gives quite often. So we're pretty excited for that. At 10 o'clock, we will have uh, presentations from our um, uh, keynote, uh, sorry, our, our premier sponsors. We have two of them signed up. One is Travel Curious, as you heard. The under is Indie Travel, which is an OTA. Uh, and then after that, the sessions will start at 11 o'clock. Now, a couple of words about this. Uh, today, an email went out to all attendees uh, asking, uh, giving you the link to upload your guide profiles to the Campfire platform. And uh, this is what recruiters will be reviewing to decide whether to schedule a meeting with you or not. And uh, there are some sample uh, profile pages up there as well if you're not quite sure how to answer any of the fields. So it's really important that if you're on the fence about registering, you're not sure, uh, you really need to do it in the next day or two, uh, even if you're only interested in the recruitment part of things, because um, we're planning on Monday to open up all of the profiles to the recruiters to start uh, scheduling appointments with, uh, with guides that they wanna to talk to. Now we have over 30 recruiters signed up already and we're continuing to sign them up and we'll probably be doing that right up until a week from today or a week from tomorrow. Um, and uh, it's a mix of tour operators, OTAs, res tech companies, and it's really up to them to decide, first of all, who they want to invite, but also the format. Uh, some will schedule one-on-one -on -one interviews, some will have kind of group interviews, and others might just have open house Zoom sessions where you can come in and uh, find out more information about the company. That's more likely to be for the, uh, the OTAs and the rest of companies as opposed to the, uh, the tour operators. And once we launch the ability for the recruiters to look at your profiles, that's when we will, um, uh, name everybody who signed up as a recruiter. Uh, we just don't want it to launch it too early to have communication starting before everybody is ready. So, but that should be really, really exciting. Again, we have no control over who gets scheduled for which uh, appointment, but at various times through the conference, there'll be opportunities to network virtually as well. So if you didn't necessarily get uh, an appointment, uh, you might be able to contact them through uh, the campfire uh, uh, platform, like I said, and uh, and your profile on Campfire is going to stay up there in perpetuity. So uh, other recruiters who might come through might view that uh, as well, as well as other recruiters who might have signed up for Guide Week but haven't, um, uh, but aren't able to attend all day on Friday or maybe not at all. We know we're all starting to get very, very busy. So that is pretty much what uh, what recruitment day is going to look like. Obviously, this is all coming together a little bit last minute. We're doing the best we can, but there you should have plenty of time uh, to uh, get the information you need as you go uh, along. Uh, one last thing, I mentioned the uh, where we have registrants from already, um, but when I last I looked, we had 175 people registered for Guide Week, which is absolutely amazing. And uh, when I talk about the networking, uh, a lot of it is going to take place in the lounge, which I'm clicking on right now. My ancient computer will get here in just a second. Uh, Mitch and Nikki make fun of me all the time for my super old MacBook. Um, but if you see here, there's basically like a Facebook wall. It's loading right now. Uh, so, uh, but there's basically a Facebook wall where you can come and interact with people from all around the world. So here's my message. Here's David Spooner. Here is Emma. Here's Mitch uh, and various other people as well. So, uh, and you can see the people who are active in uh, on the network right now, Tony DeSante, Robin Gar, although I think the red dot means maybe they're not actually looking at their profiles right or not looking at the stage right now. But uh, in any event, um, 
we really think this is going to be a wonderful, oh, we're up to 176. Awesome. Went up while we were here. Um, we, it's going to be a great event. Uh, we've learned a lot. We hope that uh, this might become a fixture on the Ghana calendar, but uh, we'll worry about that after we get through next week. And uh, I think I've probably taken up way too much time, uh, but I am happy to answer any questions um, about the event. So thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, and everybody, please put your questions in the chat and Mike will be able to see them there. One question from Nina, she did ask, will there be a list of recruiters? Um, will that be made available, that be published? Uh, we are gonna be make that available either Sunday or Monday. So Great, great. Uh, yeah, but like good. I said, it's a mix of New York tour operators, uh, over the road tour operators, OTAs and reservation technology companies. It's going to be really, really great. And I was playing around with my profile and with the with the forum. Um, the link is right there to register for and for more information. It's travelcampfire.com slash guide week. Okay, so you'll find that in the chat. So really, um, and this is for you guys. And Mike has been working like crazy. And hold on a second. And so Sorry, Jack, Jeremy Treasure isn't here, but Jeremy, my cat, had to sit on my keyboard. So, um, yeah, so great. Thank you so much, Mike. This is really, really wonderful. So the link um, is right there in the chat. Just scroll up in the chat. It says um, it's um, guideweek.org. You'll be directed right to it, and you'll see it um, in the chat as well. Okay, so one more thing just before um, I turn everything over to Kevin. Also, our um, our um, one of our... One of our uh, partners has, um, Ina Selden is here and she wanted to let everyone know the New Amsterdam History Center on their website. They're going to be give, doing a wonderful, wonderful panel on New York Loves Vermeer. And uh, the event is actually on May 11th, but we're doing Guide Week. But once you register, you can still access it. And so here is the link to it, okay? And I will also post the, um, uh, the codes that um, Ina very kindly gave to us. So I'm just posting those right now, okay? And I'll post again the link for Guide Week uh, for those of you who have not seen that. And sorry about the cat again. But I'll post that now while I'm going to turn everything over to Kevin. So Kevin will, if you could take it away and we'll have our wonderful guests. And thank you so much, Mike. Uh, um, bienvenidos a todos. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for all that great work. It's a very exciting week coming up. And thank you, Emma, for that introduction. Just a point of sort of logistical interacting with one another in the field of, of the chat. If you can go to the two field, it defaults, I think, to panelists. But if you can choose panelists and attendees, you'll be sharing your questions and your information that you're posting with more than just uh, us panelists who are on screen you'll be sharing it with your fellow members. So please uh, do that and do put your questions in there. And yes, uh, New York loves Vermeer. We love our Dutch community, but today we're going to be celebrating our love for our, our Mexican uh, neighbors and our Mexican American uh, friends and fellow tourists that are here. When we found out that our monthly meeting here in May was going to coincide with Cinco de Mayo, we said what a great opportunity both on the the board and also the education committee, what a great opportunity to explore Mexican American tourism uh, and the Mexican American heritage here in New York City. And uh, so immediately we started sort of brainstorming who should we tap into to help us shape out a really incredible panel. And Georgina Castanano, Castanans name immediately came up. Um, at the outset, I have to say to all of my, my Mexican friend panelists here, uh, if I butcher your name, I apologize. I do not speak Spanish. Um, as I tell all of my Spanish guests on my tours, I know two phrases in Spanish, uh, and they've, they've served me actually very well. Donde es el baño? and una margarita pro favor, right? And so um, if I say your name wrong, just uh, let me know, correct me. Um, I do want to say your name right. But uh, I do want to give a shout out to Georgina Castanon, who really is the engine that brought all of these people together. She really assembled all of our incredible speakers and really thought dynamically about how we can explore this issue and celebrate Cinco de Mayo. and. New York City's relationship with um, 
our Mexican American neighbors and fellow New Yorkers. Uh, now she is not feeling well, it's nothing, she reassures me it's nothing serious, but uh, she was going to initially introduce all of them, but we wish her well and we definitely want to thank her. So I do wanna give a shout out to her. But our four panelists that we're gonna be hearing from, uh, first we're going to hear from Alejandro Cañedo Prisca, who has been involved with the tourism industry for over 25 years and he has been both the Pueblo State Secretary of Culture and Tourism and also the Pueblo City Secretary of Tourism responsible for the overall increase in the national and international tourist traffic for Puebla as a state and both as a city. And then we will also hear from Jacobeth Hernandez who is a career diplomat from Mexico and since July of 2016 she is working with the Council for Economic Affairs at the Council, I'm sorry, she is the Council for Economic Affairs at the Consulate General of Mexico here in New York City. And in that role, she's the point of contact for the government of Mexico in terms of trade, investment, and tourism promotion in New York, in New, York New Jersey, and Connecticut, so the tri-state area. Uh, and then we will hear from Alejandro Ramos, who is currently based in New York City, as the Senior Vice President of U.S. Chapters Operation and Executive Director of the Northeast Chapter of the United States Mexico Chamber of Commerce, a premier nonprofit business association of multinational companies, financial institutions, and international firms. And then uh, last but not least, we have uh, Lorena Cortez Guadalupe, who is a product specialist for Aero Mexico, which is based in, New and she is based in New York City. And she has over 17 years experience working in the area of aviation industry responsible for identifying business opportunities and coordinating sales strategies, as well as developing community engagement with government, local organizations, chambers of commerce, and convention and uh, visiting bureaus. And so we are incredibly honored to have all of you join us here tonight and uh, happy Cinco de Mayo to all of you. And with that said, uh, we're going to start with Alejandro Cañedo Presco, because as we just heard, he is from the state of Puebla, which, as I understand it, is very much connected to Cinco de Mayo. I think, you know, a lot of Americans uh, immediately think Cinco, they, they conflate Cinco de Mayo with Mexican Independence Day, because we think July 4th, and we think, you know, month and date, but that's not the case, right? And so you're gonna help explain what is Cinco de Mayo? What is its significance in Mexico? And then how has it contributed to international tourism and how we celebrate it here in New York and in America? So uh, Alejandro Cañedo, can you share your screen? Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. I'm very happy to be with you. Sorry if my English is not well fluent. I will try my best. Um, I will talk about the Battle of Puebla because the Battle of Puebla is the meaning of Cinco de Mayo. Puebla is a great state. When we went to the United States, we say, we are the Cinco de Mayo city. Find out the heritage and the culture behind the big fiesta. Because in America, in the United States, Cinco de Mayo is a party. For us, it's a, play, a time to remember what happened, what happened with our city and with the country. In 1862, the Mexican army defeated the French army. In that time, was considered the strongest army of the world. Cinco de Mayo has the roots in Puebla because our army was a small army, but we beat them knowing about the field. And because we have a, a general, Ignacio Zaragoza, who was born in what actually is Texas, Corpus Christi, but in that time, what part of was part of when he was born was Mexico, Mexico, and he, with all his imagination and knowledge, defeat the French army. But why is important the Cinco de Mayo to celebrate in the United States? The doctor David E. A. Bautista make a great job because we, this is link between America and Mexico. The French army didn't only want to take over Mexico to get off their money because there's a big debt from Mexico government in that time to France, but they want to put a ruler 
a emperor or a king from Mexico. But not, not, not was only that thing. They want to go over Mexico, cross the border, and help the South in the Civil War. And that thing is they suppose that in the 20th century, the United States is going to be the biggest country in the world. What is this? But if they help the South to defeat the North and have two countries, there will be a lot of French uh, influence all over the world. But the Cinco de Mayo of 1862, the French army was defeated. So all the things they want to do in the United States was stop it. After many months, the North defeated the South and the United States keep like a one only country. And they start celebrating in California that the Cinco de Mayo is the time for America, that we will be all together and nobody from Europe or any other continent could come to, to defeat us and make a ruler for us. The French army didn't went back to France. To France, they came to Puebla a year later, and they took over us for four years. They have a imperialist ruler, Maximiliano de Habsburgo, but in 1862, April 2, in Puebla, they start the battle against that, and the Mexican army defeat again the French army, and then Mexico became the country that is free from Europe. That is Cinco de Mayo important, between Mexico and Cinco de Mayo and in the United States. Also, our Independence Day is on September 16, but I think it's more difficult to the Americans to pronounce 16 de September than Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo is more easy. But many people say that maybe Cinco de Mayo is our independence, but no. You know, in a lot of Mexico, they don't celebrate Cinco de Mayo. They celebrate Cinco de Mayo in the state of Puebla and the, in the United States. Maybe you know that in New York, is the place after Puebla City, more people born from Puebla is living. When you go to a restaurant in New York, ask the waitress where they come from. I think that from five of every 10 people you ask, they will say it's from Puebla. About 1 million people from our state lives in New York, New Jersey, and many other places around the area. So when you want to eat, to know, and to celebrate the Cinco de Mayo, come to Puebla. We have the second biggest parade in the, in the country. Today, we should have that parade, but we have two years in a row cancel that parade. That is the biggest parade with millions of, mil a lot of people, not millions, a lot of people in the streets. We, in Puebla, we have a lot of things. There's a picture of our, of our, our parade. And, and then Cinco de Mayo. And if you want to come to Puebla, you can fly from New York to Houston and then to Puebla, or you can fly with Mexico from New York directly to Mexico City and take a bus directly from the airport to Puebla. We are two, two hours away. We have flight with Mexico to Monterrey and other airlines to other uh, cities in our small airport, but we are very really close to Mexico City, an hour and a half. We have a lot of great hotels. I put it there, uh, international things. There's the BW plant, the biggest BW, Volkswagen plant outside Germany in the whole the world is in Puebla. Also, the Audi plant that makes all the luxury cars from the United States is in the state. There's, this is our cathedral, the most beautiful cathedral of any cathedral of Latin America. So I think you have a lot of time. This is our birth of certificate. And one thing I would like to talk very fast is our food. When you see Mexican food, there is no Texas Texan food. We have the best Mexican food. We are the kitchen of Mexico. 
the famous Mole Poblano and other things are from our city and the state. So you, you may come to Puebla maybe next year to see how we celebrate Cinco de Mayo. And you will understand more about our heritage and our culture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. That was very informative. And uh, so I am just curious, a follow-up question. Um, if I understand it correctly, what you're saying is that Cinco de Mayo is not celebrated in other parts of Mexico, but it is celebrated in America, right? And so why is that? Why, why do Americans sort of see this as the day to celebrate Mexican-American heritage rather than your day of liberty? It's got to be more than, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the September day, so, right? But it's got to be more than that, right? Because there was a lot of marketing in the 70s and 80s of many uh, beer companies and other markets that say celebrate Cinco de Mayo because there was a link. It's like St. Patrick Days from uh, Irish. Cinco de Mayo is not only for Mexican, it's for everyone who speaks Spanish who living in the United States. It was the link because we battled against a powerful country that was France at that time. And in Mexico, they celebrate, but not so hard because people from Puebla are, we are different. Maybe Jacobet and, and Emma say, and Lorena say, and Alejandro Tocayo, say that poblanos are different, but I don't know what's happening because we celebrate a lot of things in Puebla. Uh, Jacob is, is, is laughing because people in Puebla, they like New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't like us in all of the country, but we are the best place to live and, and visit. Well, I'm an well, Irish, Irish, Irish New Yorker and you just spoke my language, which was beer, right? And so, yeah, just like St. Patty's Day makes sense to, to me, for everybody, I can see how Cinco de Mayo would become a day for everyone. Um, so, Jacobeth, uh, Alejandro just called upon you. I guess you're not from Pueblo. Uh, you must be from a different state. Um, but it was interesting that he said about uh, if you ask most New Yorkers, Mexican American New Yorkers, where they're from in Mexico, if they are immigrants, uh, that they, I think he said, the majority of them would actually be from Pueblo. Uh, could you tell us a little bit, as, as somebody who works with the consulate, about the diversity of the Mexican American community, where we can find them in New York City, and the different sort of waves of migration throughout history to New York? Sure, Kevin. Uh, but first, let me say uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Georgina. Uh, this is really looking great. Um, Alejandro is a celebrity when it comes to tourism in Mexico, and then uh, Alejandro Ramos and Lorena, I really feel among, among friends. Thank you for the invitation. So first, what I do at the consulate, um, I, I'm in charge of tourism, trade, investment, whatever you want, and I'm the point of contact. And then from then, from then uh, we, can, we, we can work from, from that point on, all right? But um, just so you know, uh, what, I, what I do is I promote Mexico, right? And it's kind of an easy sell and not because 7% of our GDP comes from tourism. So it's really important to us, it's, but it's not just Cancun. There are so many destinations just like um, Puebla, but it's, um, and now if, what, since the Mexican tourism board closed, uh, that, it's, that means even more work to, to promote Mexico. Um, but you know, it was the seventh most visited uh, country in 2018. Also, uh, it's important right now because uh, the WTTC, I always get this wrong, World Travel and Tourism um, Council, I think, chose Cancun, Mexico to be its, uh, to, to have its summit this year. And it was like the first really, really big tourism in-person gathering, and it was a huge success. So it, it says a lot about what Mexico is in terms of tourism. But just so you have that in mind. And then going back to your question, and Alejandro did part of, of the work that I was supposed to do here to talk about the Mexican community uh, here, um, the Mexican New Yorkers throughout history. Um, there are like different types and different fluxes of migration of Mexicans to let's say New York. So um, it, it, the biggest, um, Flux of migration to New York started like in the 1990s. I, I, I read studies about this and everything, but I, it's, I'm just gonna give you the, the 
just the, the panorama. So in the, it, there were some Mexicans before that, let's say some 60,000, but not really. And then from the 1990s until today, um, they, um, uh, I, I forgot how to say this. Um, there are six times more Mexicans than there, there used to be at the time. I'm not so sure it's 1 million people from Puebla in the tri-state area, like Alejandro says, and the US census will tell you that it's um, some 725,000. But our estimates of Mexicans in the tri-state area, it's 1.2 million. And yes, most of them will be from Puebla or from a region that's called the Mixteca, which is Puebla, Guerrero, um, and I'm forgetting the Oaxaca mainly. And th these are also uh, places with, uh, with a huge cultural heritage from all of Mexico states, but they're also uh, states that uh, in some regions, especially um, the, the education is not the higher, higher education. Also many of them, like 60% will be uh, male immigrants uh, and not, not, not women immigrants. So that is the kind of uh, migration that uh, started coming from the 90s and that made the percentage uh, of, of Hispanic people in New York State go from some 3.5% to some 13.5%. So it's more significant now than it used to be in the 80s, all right? But that's not the only type of Mexican migration or Mexican uh, people that are here. You have Mexican Americans, children from those generations, which will be young teenagers or in their 20s or barely 30s because of this very recent migration. And you will also have what we call the highly qualified Mexicans, the professionals that are working in Wall Street, that are working in the marketing agencies that are, um, and just so you have an idea, I'm gonna call some people out. Uh, the project manager of the World Trade Center, he is Mexican. Um, the, one of the entrepreneurs that, that had one of, the, one of the biggest three IPOs in NASDAQ in 2020 is a Mexican. Um, the best woman chef in 2020, I think, 2020 or 2019, I forgot the year. Uh, she works in uh, Cosme and she is Mexican and uh, right here uh, in New York. So you have these kinds of, of, of very qualified, very talented uh, Mexicans that are part of, of all of the contributions, either in the kitchens of the Israeli restaurants, because you will find Pueblans and Mexicans there, or in the kitchen of Cosme and in uh, Broadway, etc. So those are all the kinds of Mexicans. And let's not forget the other kinds of, of Mexicans that, we, that are important for you, which are the visitors to New York City because New York City has among the top 10 international visitors, I don't remember the number, I think it's like the ninth or something, uh, Mexicans, because in 2018, New York City got 500, almost 500,000 uh, Mexican visitors uh, for, for tourism purposes to New York City. They're actually, the, from all of the Hispanic markets, including Spain, they're the number one market for uh, tourism for New York. So that is so important that actually uh, New York City, the government of New York City and the government of Mexico City, they have an MOU to uh, market recipro to re reciprocally, I guess, uh, that's how you say it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it makes a lot cheaper for New York City to have uh, advertisements everywhere in Mexico City and advertisement campaigns. I think that actually Aeromexico is also participating in that from what I remember and vice versa, Mexico City gets marketing uh, over here. So that's how important the relation is. And then, um, and th there was another part of the question about events, but I will, I will just uh, stay there and if you have any okay. questions. Yeah. No, that was a great uh, answer to your question. And believe me, as tour guides, we do not forget the tourists who are coming from Mexico. We love all the, the high financiers and the chefs and everything, but we really love the Mexican tourists who are coming to New York, right? And so um, I am just curious, uh, Jacob, but I think when a lot of Americans or even New Yorkers, when they hear about Mexican American, they immediately think of Texas, California, New Mexico, which I think is just natural that that's gonna be the highest concentration in terms of demographics of immigration going to America. But where does New York fit into it, it, you know, the rest of the country. Is this a, is this a destination for a lot of Mexican Americans? Not, not really. Uh, I don't have the numbers, uh, but what I can tell you, it's that no, not really. It's not like a destination. 
Uh, it is for highly qualified migrants. It is, it is for Pueblans, but if you go to other regions, you will see that they're also like, if you go to Chicago, most of them will be like from Durango uh, state, let's say, for example. Um, but it is for, for example, DACA, DACA uh, recipients. They are, uh, the, the metro, New York City metro area is one of the three regions in the United States with the most DACA recipients. So that is probably the exception. Interesting. So uh, Alejandro Ramos, uh, we've heard a lot about food and in your role as uh, working with this United States Mexico Chamber of Commerce, I know that you've been involved in a particular project that is related to food. I, you know, I do a lot of tourism with uh, to China and with Chinese and there's always within the Chinese community a whole battle about where the best food from the regions of China are from. I'm curious if you agree with Alejandro Cañedo that the best food is from Puebla. <laughs> well, I have to, to say that my grandmother was uh, from the state of Yucatan and the people from Yucatan used to say that they had the best food as well. So it is always a, a, battle, a, a battle about that. Well, well anyway, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the invitation to participate in this, uh, in this very interesting uh, panel. Uh, of course, I will uh, address uh, this initiative that we have uh, regarding the uh, Mexican food. But first of all, I, I would like to give you a little background about the chamber and uh, a couple of data that I think that they may be of interest uh, for, for the tourist guides here in, in, in New York. Well, I, I, we are, uh, as you mentioned, a nonprofit organization, a business association. This year, we are becoming a 100 year old. So it's, a, it's the centennial of the, of the chamber that was a, a, that opened its first office in, in New York City in the Woolworth building. At that time, it was the, the tallest building in, in the world. And of course, well, a, 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 here, in, a, here in New York City. And basically a, our role, our mission is to promote business between Mexico and the, and the United States. Most of uh, our members are a uh, multinational companies, large corporations, a lot of uh, financial institutions that are active and engaged in business between both countries. And uh, we have several activities at the, at the chamber. Uh, we facilitate the contact between Mexican executives and US uh, executives. And of a special interest for, for your for the audience is uh, precisely the, the Mexicans that, that come here to, to New York for, for business. Uh, as uh, Hakobet uh, just mentioned, uh, around half a million Mexicans visit New York every year. But from those uh, half million, even though there are no specific uh, statistics, a lot of them, they come uh, for business purposes. But as you know, when you come to, to New York, you cannot skip tourism. You come to, to New York in several cases, and we see it when we organize uh, conferences, uh, seminars, uh, well, pre-COVID, and hopefully soon uh, we will restart in-person events. These uh, individuals, they come several times with their significant others, with their spouses, families, and they come for a conference probably, uh, or for business, uh, I don't know, a Thursday, Friday, and they spend the rest of the weekend here in, in, in New York for, for tourism. It's a very different profile of, of tourists. It is not the, let's say the, the traditional one that comes to see the Statue of Liberty and go to the Empire State Building. They are people that come quite often to, to New York. So these people, they are looking for, for new things to do. Uh, uh, for something that is beyond the the traditional, the typical uh, visits that you do when you come for the first time to, to New York. Uh, these Mexicans, uh, they love shopping. They love uh, fine dining. They love to see the new places. Uh, if you, well, before COVID, if you, if you were in the, uh, in the Hudson Yards area, it was easy to, to see a lot of uh, these uh, Mexicans uh, visiting the area because again, the spouse probably was uh, in a law firm uh, in one of these uh, new buildings, but the rest that they were there and they met for, for lunch in one of these new, new, new restaurants. So there is, there is a, a niche opportunity there 
to cater, a, in this case, a, a, a tours for this type of, uh, of, of visitors, which are not necessarily, again, the, the, the traditional ones, but at the, same, at the same time, they are usually a, bigger spenders. Uh, they, their disposable income for, for tourism is it's higher and they, they like uh, more personalized uh, things, more things catered to either in sometimes related to, 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 to their business. Jacobet uh, uh, was mentioning that one of the uh, a Mexican uh, architect, he's one of the leaders of the development of the World Trade Center. Uh, so some, sometimes what we have done is to take some uh, real estate investors that even come with, with their families to do a tour at the, at the World Trade Center because they want to know uh, the, the World Trade Center, how it's like built, developed, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's, so, it's a sort of different kind of, uh, kind of, uh, of tour. If you have uh, financiers coming for, from Mexico, if they are more like junior analysts, well, they, they love to go to, to Wall Street uh, to see the New York Stock Exchange which is something that uh, it's, uh, it's an opportunity. It's definitely an opportunity for the, for the tourism industry here in, 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 in New York. And well, having that said, and, and I'm gonna go back to your initial question. Uh, at the chamber, well, in addition to these big, big institutions, we have also as members, uh, companies or a, in this case, restaurants that have some sort of Mexican, Mexican heritage. Uh, Every year we, we used to do a traditional uh, luncheon in Cinco de Mayo. Uh, we have done this in different uh, venues, restaurants, but uh, because of the situation with, with, with COVID, uh, last year we were unable to do it. But at the same time, we, we wanted to, to help the, the restaurant industry, the Mexican restaurant industry in New York. And we started with this initiative, which is uh, basically last year was just to, to promote uh, among uh, our membership, our network, uh, for people to eat Mexican food, to consume Mexican spirits, Mexican wine, Mexican, Mexican beer. At that time, it was basically deliveries. So uh, uh, we, we partner with uh, several restaurants. We invite them to be part of this initiative. And uh, I think that it, we got very good recognition. Uh, the restaurants were, were happy with the, with the results. Uh, this year, well, we, when we were starting to, to prepare for, for Cinco de Mayo, it, was, uh, it wasn't clear whether restaurants would be open, especially for large, uh, larger groups. So we decided to continue with this, uh, with this initiative uh, for the Cinco de Mayo week. But this year is a little bit different because it, it is not only about uh, deliveries and uh, pickups, but also we are inviting people to dine in, in some of these uh, in some of these uh, some of these restaurants, and what we are seeing because of the the good response is that uh, this uh, event, even though next year we, we hope to have our traditional Cinco de Mayo uh, celebration, to have the this event every year, but now with with a different kind of format, uh, something not necessarily to compete or in any way, but sim something similar to the to the to restaurant week in which we are gonna be featuring Mexican restaurants, the different kind of cuisines that we have, because well, in New York, we have from very traditional Mexican cuisine, but also some nouveau cuisine, high-end cuisine, and different high-end restaurants, but also we have a smaller, smaller even taquerias, small taco shops. And the idea is to promote and the, all, the, all the industry because uh, it's, uh, there, is, uh, there is always uh, as Mexicans and, uh, and as not Mexicans, uh, the opportunity to try authentic Mexican food and even some uh, Mexican uh, fusion food, it's, it's in New York and there is no better place to do it uh, 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 as New York City. So that's, a, that's an initiative that well, we started as a response to the, to the pandemic, but uh, it's, it's becoming a, an annual event uh, of the US-Mexico Chamber of Commerce. So I'm curious, Alejandro, uh, in your initial sort of survey of how the Mexican restaurant industry has done with COVID, have they done better than what you initially thought that they have they been able to survive more vibrantly than you thought that maybe initially or 
have they been hit even harder than you you thought? No, I think that uh, well, they, they are suffering the same the same challenges as any other restaurant uh, in, in New York City or anywhere in, in the in the United States. Uh, the, 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 the financial struggles for the for the for the restaurateurs and the to support their employees is significant. Of course, uh, things are getting better. I, I was very happy to hear it uh, this morning about the, the announcement of President Biden of this uh, special program for for small restaurants. I think that that, that is going to help a lot of uh, a lot of companies in the in, in the industry. But also, as it was mentioned before. The, the Mexican community not only work, it not only works with the, with Mexican restaurants. You can go to a Chinese restaurant and you will find Mexicans there in the kitchen, or you will go to a French restaurant. It could be a small restaurant or a very, very high-end restaurant, and you will find them there. So it's important that this support to, to the industry. It doesn't matter if it's Mexican or from, from any other type of, of, of cuisine, it's important to support them. In this case, well, of course, since we are US Mexico Chamber of Commerce, we will do, we are doing it for the for the Mexican. But yeah, we we need all to to continue promoting the the, the industry in New York City. Well, we are very thankful for all of your efforts. Um, I do know we have questions, believe me, I'm watching your questions, but I want to get first to Lorena because she is representing a really vital part of the connection between Mexico and New, uh, and New York City, which is the transportation and in particular the aviation industry with Aeromexico. And so uh, can you tell us about some of the ways that Aeromexico is responding to to COVID and what you're seeing in trends in travel from Mexico to New York uh, and whether that includes medical tourism. And maybe you want to touch on that as well. But I know you also have a, a video that you probably want to share with us. Is that right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good evening, everyone. And happy Cinco de Mayo to all of you. And first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be and very excited to be part of the panel. And as you mentioned, I'm gonna share, I'm very happy to share with you some updates about the, the new trends to travel between US and Mexico. So uh, first of all, I would like to talk about the health and cleanliness protocols. Uh, and I'm gonna talk uh, on behalf of Aero Mexico and our uh, partner Delta Airlines. So both our partner Delta and Aero Mexico had existing high standards of uh, maintenance and cleaning procedures. But under the new, uh, new context, we develop additional measures to protect the, uh, the health of our customers and employees. Delta implemented the Delta Care Standard while we created our health and sanitization management system, we call it HSMS, uh, both comprised uh, of measures and protocols based on the highest standards of cleanliness and safety in the airline industry. Uh, as you know, uh, as of January 26 this year, all passengers of uh, the age of two, including US citizens, residents, uh, visitors, and also uh, passengers in transit must have a PCR or antigen test uh, performed by an uh, authorized laboratory, a complete attestation form, and use a face mask, mask uh, at the, at the uh, airplane and in the airport. So it's a, a required for everybody. So these measures have been very well received by all our passengers since it has uh, offered an extra layer of protections to, to them and also offer a peace of mind all, all our customers traveling between Mexico and US. So to support customers to get a COVID-19 detection test, Aeromexico signed an agreement with seven laboratories in Mexico, very well recognized laboratories. And we offer a special discounts and a special services for uh, any passengers traveling with Aeromexico or Delta Airlines. If you need extra information, you can visit our website, aeromexico.com and you can check the, the fares, the location, et cetera, et cetera. Also, I would like to uh, inform you about our services from US to, from specifically from New York to Mexico. We have four uh, daily flights from New York to Mexico City, two operated by Delta and two operated uh, by Aeromexico. Actually on effective June 1st, 
we're going to start with a new red eye uh, service that is is uh, is new uh, and going to be daily. Also, we offer services between Cancun and and, and New York. Uh, we're going to offer two daily flights from Cancun to New York, and also we have a weekly flight from Los Cabos to New York. It's on Saturdays, so it's it's I'm proud to to share that we have all of the the services from Mexico to New York. And also, Kevin, as you mentioned, uh, talking about medical tourism, I just want to let you know that we are concentrating uh, our efforts on guaranteeing a safe experience through our extensive protocol and measures, offer a wide network and consistent service, uh, so our customers can enjoy the travel experience. So it's, it's the, the statement that we can uh, share with you. And last but not least, I would like to share with you a video where you can see part of our services and we can, how can we uh, are serving our travelers from US to Mexico. So just give me one second. And please don't hesitate to reach me out if you have any questions. you know why Aeromexico is your best option to fly? We're Mexico's global airline with more than 86 years connecting people to where they need to be. We're pioneers in implementing strict protocols and a health and sanitization system to protect you. We're the only ones in Mexico who sanitize their aircraft between each flight. We know that your plans can change. That's why we offer you the best flexible travel options. When you fly with us, you're flying on the best aircraft in the world. A modern, safe, and eco-friendly fleet. You can also join our loyalty program, Club Premier. We know how valuable your time is, which is why we're the most punctual airline in Mexico. Thanks to you and the best talent in the aviation industry, we connect Mexico with the world. For this and many more reasons, together we keep flying. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lorena. And uh, thank you everyone for those, I think it was a nicely structured type of conversation from getting from Cinco de Mayo to how uh, we can get to Mexico and how Mexicans are getting to us safely uh, during this COVID period. Uh, the question I think that most frequently is coming up, I'm just going to sort of meld all of them together, uh, but it has to do with, you are all very familiar, I think, with New York, and you're talking to a New York audience. And so people want to know what is the most authentic experience that people can have in New York, whether it's cuisine um, or other ways of experiencing uh, the culture. And then very specifically, there was an interesting question whether uh, the in this Mexican cuisine week that Alejandro, you were talking about, can the restaurants be sorted out by borough and by the particular region of Mexico cuisines? So by particular states, you mentioned Yucatan or Puebla um, and local and local dishes. Um, and I also am just very curious, are there particular, you know, I know a little bit about Sunset Park. There seems to be a, a concentration of Mexicans in Sunset Park, but are there particular areas in New York City where you think that if, tourists coming to New York wanted to know a little bit more about the contributions of Mexican Americans to New York City uh, culture, where they could actually get more experience of that. Well, I can, I can start uh, regarding the, the, the information. Well, there is, no, there is no Mexican Chinatown, I would say. Uh, Mexicans are uh, all over the all over the place, and wherever you you go, you will find something related to to, to Mexico. And I think that the the most important uh, heritage that Mexico, the most important thing that Mexico brings to New York are Mexicans, because uh, anywhere you go and you find a, a Mexican in the service uh, service industry, you will feel the the warmth the friendliness of the, of the Mexican people. 
It doesn't matter if it's, uh, again, uh, if you are in a hotel and someone that works in the hotel is, is Mexican, or if you go to, to, uh, to a restaurant or, or simply the person that delivers the food is, is uh, Mexican or the bank teller, et cetera. So I think that the Mexicans are, are, are everywhere. And uh, regarding the, the, the experience in terms of foods, it depends on what, what, you are, what you are looking for. If you, uh, if you want more like a kind of a Mexican uh, a street food, of course, if you go to Sunset Park and some areas in, 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 the, other, in the other boroughs, you will find a food that is very, very similar to what you can find in, in, in Mexico. But you may be interested in the, or bringing some of your tour, uh, uh, the, the people that go to your tours to a Mexican restaurant, and they, they, they are going to be in Broadway. All around Broadway, there are some very good authentic, authentic Mexican restaurants. Or if they want to uh, have a, a different kind of experience in an upscale restaurant, uh, just what it, it, it was mentioned before, Cosme. Cosme in Mexico City, well, the, the, the chef has one of the best restaurants in the world in Mexico City. So that, that's another option to have this kind of uh, upscale uh, Mexican, Mexican food. So it's, uh, it's open. It's uh, a, a, anywhere you, you want to go, you will feel that. In terms of uh, culture, well, there, there are plenty of uh, festivals uh, related to, to Mexico all year round. In some cases, it could be traditional uh, folk dances in, in Queens or even in, in, in Manhattan or uh, Mex Mexican jazz players. You, can, you may find some playing at, uh, at uh, DC Coca-Cola or any other uh, jazz venue here in New York. Also, we have a wonderful uh, artist uh, participating in, in, in Broadway shows. So it's, uh, it, it's present. And from time to time, the orchestras present uh, Mexican music from classical, uh, classical composers. Uh, so uh, again, it's, uh, I would say it's, it's everywhere. It is not that uh, you take everybody to Mexico town, but it's all over. Of course, there are some areas with the higher con concentration of uh, Mexican people and with Mexican uh, traditions. But uh, I would say that it's just a matter of uh, uh, going everywhere. You can find anything in New York. Like being Irish, <laughs> we're everywhere. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for that. I, I have to give a shout out for last year, the Whitney Museum did an incredible exhibition, in my opinion, the best exhibition they've ever done called Vida Americana, which was all about the Mexican muralist influence on a lot of American artists and specifically uh, artists that are situated here. So Diego Rivera and Jose Orcaso, th their influence on Jackson Pollock and Jacob Lawrence and so many of the artists that we see. So uh, Jacob, Beth, I'm, I'm very curious though, like, so like the Irish, we're everywhere, but the Irish also have things like the Irish Arts Center, they have cultural institutions, the Irish Historical Society. Are there, is there something like that in for the Mexican or like the Chinese MOCA, the Museum of Chinese in America? Are there cultural institutions that are showcasing Mexican artists, Mexican writers, Mexican, uh, you know, arts here in New York City? Um, yes, there are several. I have, since I am from the consulate, I have to tell you about the Mexican Cultural Institute in New York, which is one of the Mexican cultural institutes from our foreign, foreign affairs systems. They're everywhere in, Ber in Berlin, in DC, etc. So there's one in New York. And this is the one that we do have like a small gallery in the consulate that has exhib exhibitions every now and then, but, but mostly we work with other uh, organizations, museums, etc. Like there was a collaboration actually for this Whitney exhibition that you are talking about and they are working for this year in a, in a, I mean, this is all work in progress because COVID has made it so difficult to actually confirm our events for this year. But if it's possible, there will be an opera of Moctezuma because Vivaldi wrote an opera about Moctezuma for some reason. And then uh, we translated it to, I think it's Nahuatl or something. And we're gonna have it in a, in a park in Brooklyn or up here in Brooklyn. So that, that's like for, in, for September. 
Um, and that's just one of the things that, uh, and then there will be like an exhibition of, of codex. Is it how, how you say it? Codex, you know, like these, um, the Mayan, uh, Mayan, the Mayan codex. <laughs> yeah, there will be one with the replicas, but like these super authorized, super, super quality replicas of the ones that are in Florence and all of those places that have uh, noble Hispanic codex. Uh, so we'll have that. And there are other organizations, lots of organizations that, that do this. There is Friends of Folk, Oaxacan Art. There is, um, I, I don't, Mano a Mano, uh, that is the one that collaborates with the American Museum of Natural History on their Dia de Muertos event. And there's also this very big fest that's called the Mexico Now Fest. It happens every year around November. And it's when most of the events that have to do with Mexican artists um, um, happen. Thank you. And, and where is the consulate uh, if people wanted to go see that uh, particular exhibit space? It's in Midtown Manhattan, really close to Grand Central, um, 39th, on 39th between Madison and Park. Uh, oh. But uh, I'll, I'll write the page of the Mexican Cultural Institute right here so that you know when the exhibits are happening. Great. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I do think that we are running out of time. I know that there were some very specific questions about linguistics and it's, it's Spanish and indigenous people, which is very interesting, but I think that that's such a huge topic that it almost like deserves its own panel, which I'm very curious about it, but I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to that. Um, and I just wanna thank all of you, uh, Alejandro, Canedo. I have to say I was, actually on Liberty Island today giving a tour about the Statue of Liberty. And had I known much more about Cinco de Mayo and its relationship to the Second Empire and Napoleon III, it would have really just given a whole new perspective of how I was giving a tour about this French gift, which was all about liberty and Cinco, on Cinco de Mayo, which is also about you know, uh, Mexican liberty. So I think that this is something that we can all take away as, as tour guides here. But thank you so much, Alejandro. Uh, Jacobeth, Alejandro Ramos, and Lorena. Um, we really have enjoyed this conversation. It was really, really insightful and uh, great and informative. Yes. So thank you for having us. Yes. Thank you all. Muchísimas gracias. And if everyone, if you open the chat, you'll see links to various information, uh, including our guests have been very generous with their emails and their other information. I mean, I just, I'm, well, first of all, I'm getting really hungry now, and I really want to travel. And just to see, and Lorena, seeing that the you know the airlines advertisement, I'm just I am busting to travel. <laughs> just really, so this was great. It's inspiring to you know keep in mind our wonderful Mexican communities here in New York, but also just this longing to to go to visit um, Puebla and and um, Jacob. Uh, I'm so excited for the codices that will be coming. I study manuscripts and Mayan manuscripts are amazing. So I think this is gonna be, gonna be really great. So thank you. And thank you, Kevin and Bob for organizing this through our um, education committee and a humongous thanks to Jordina who is not feeling well, who's languishing at home and I hope she'll be able to watch this video. But um, it was really, this was great. This was just what we needed. And so um, thank you all very, very much. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, put you all as attendees and you're welcome to, or you're welcome to leave the meeting um, when you're, whenever you're ready, but you're, of course you're also welcome to stay. And I'm gonna pass things over to Mike right now who is next to talk about our industry partners. So muchísimas gracias. I Adios. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Gracias. We will you in Puebla. We are the real yeah, Mexican well. city. Well. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm... Thank you for having us. Gracias. Good night. Okay. That was, that was really spectacular. Thank you so much. And uh, it's funny, my wife and I were just talking today about perhaps going to Mexico this summer. So this was great timing. Uh, for me personally, but it was really wonderful. And, and uh, I hope this gives us some resources to refer to. Like Kevin said, during his tour today, he could have uh, used that uh, information. So uh, in any event, just real quick, uh, we are voting on one industry partner today. It is Harlem One Stop. And I just published the poll. It is going via email, uh, via Wild Apricot to all full voting members of GANIC. So you should be getting it in the next few minutes. 
and uh, the poll will remain open until tomorrow morning. Uh, in the email, there will be a, a link to their website in case you didn't have a chance to see it. Um, they're a tour operator and community organizer in Harlem, and I think they've done some other stuff with, with Gannick uh, previously. So uh, be on the lookout for that email. Please vote when you receive it, and um, should be good to go. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. So everyone, yeah, be on the lookout for that. Let me bring Nina in now. She is our next, um, she is our next speaker who will be, um, who will be giving us the education committee report. So Nina should be coming, there she is. Okay, Nina, if you- I started, okay, I should, oh, my video keeps going out. All right, here I am, hello. <laughs> You hear me now? Okay. You're just fine. Okay, great. So uh, we're doing a ed education committee report. Uh, and uh, thanks to all the committee members, Bob Gelber, Jeremy Wilcox, John Semlak, Kevin Lawrence, uh, uh, and uh, Minna Sharp and Susan Birnbaum. Uh, we are, uh, thank, thank you for uh, past FAMS and, and coming up. Uh, we have on May 7th, Victoria, Victorian Flatbush with Jeremy Wilcox is a, a FAM tour coming up. So, and I think the registration uh, is, it may be still open. We're, we're having limited numbers of people, I think no more than 15. So if it's full, you could always contact the guide and, and they may be doing an encore. And then we have on May uh, 22nd, East Village Music Venues, of the 1970s, long gone but not forgotten with Anne McDermott. Uh, and it's an in-person tour. And the encore is June 12th. And uh, it's very popular. It's, uh, I think the June 12th is filled up. But again, we'll, uh, there's ways of contacting uh, our tour guides and maybe they will, uh, you can hop on one of their tours. Um, and uh, June 4th, Bushwick Street Art Tour with Jeremy Wilcox. And uh, that uh, is, I've, I've gone on both of Jeremy's tours, they're wonderful. Uh, and so I hope if you haven't had a chance of taking his tours uh, of the two, these two great Brooklyn tours, you'll get a chance to. I just wanna thank you for our last month contributors uh, for FAM tours and professional development uh, program. Uh, John Semlak did, uh, and a lot of these, You, what's wonderful now that we've gone virtual is if you missed a tour, uh, they're on our website. You just go under documents and you'll see all our membership meetings recorded. So if you miss this meeting, you can uh, get a chance to preview it again. Uh, and then you can click on the website again. Uh, and so John's uh, Yaroslav the Wise and Nicholas the Wet uh, was a joint uh, project between uh, the uh, uh, Kiev Guides Association and uh, Ed and multi multiling uh, multilingual committees. And so, if you miss that, it's on our website. You can. It was fascinating. And Italian theater, 1805 to 1940, a virtual walk through stories, buildings, and place. Laura Caparati. Uh, tour is virtual and you can just enjoy that again and review it as much as you want. And uh, coming up, we were asked by Michael uh, to, uh, uh, to do something prior to guide week that would help pre uh, prepare guides for putting their best foot forward. So we came up with a resume writing workshop with Susan Gold and Bob Gelber and Michael Morgenthal, our two vice presidents, uh, help bring it uh, to you. Uh, Michael is a facilitator and Bob was an excellent moderator. Lisa Puccio helped organize it along with, with my, myself. So it, it, it's a really, it's an interesting workshop. It's hands-on and uh, for tour guides, uh, resumes are reviewed and, and you can take away something from it that might help you put your best foot forward. And that is on tape. Uh, and Midtown Historic Hotels and everything in between, Amy Cook, uh, who was a part of the certification program, developed this tour. And uh, uh, she did it once before, she, she did it again. 
and it's 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 wonderful and i hope she does it an encore of that i don't have information about that i want to also thank bob and and uh, kevin and georgina katzenon for putting together this wonderful guest speaker program and if you have ideas for guest speakers the education committee that's our wheelhouse just you know email us and uh, you get a chance to introduce the guest speaker uh, now we just got hot off the presses the national world war one memorial in washington dc is open and yannick has received an inf uh, invitation from our friends from dc uh, Christina Bauer, who is uh, co-chairs the education committee, and uh, we're going to uh, attach it to this uh, minutes. And you just click on uh, their link, and you'll get to visit uh, the memorial, uh, uh, courtesy of the DC Guild. And it goes into the background and history, the story of the World War One memorial, uh, the tour, the design features the history of World War I to which the memorial speaks, uh, and the free World War I memorial apps, one app for use when you're visiting the World War I memorial, one app which brings the World War I memorial remotely to any classroom uh, and living room or yard, and how World War I changed America, a downloadable website on, on the social and cultural impact of World War I. So uh, all these, it's wonderful that we have this ongoing relationship with DC Guild and with the, also with the Philadelphia Guild. And uh, we've done programs with them before and it's very, very nice that they've invited us uh, to tour this new memorial. So that, that, that is the latest. We have all, we have a, an ongoing list of people who've done tour, who've done, given tours for us. And so if you want an expert, uh, and uh, you can uh, just look at our running index as a part of the, the minutes. Uh, one more thing, if you want to do a tour, I attach the link to the minutes. It's in the document section. And a lot of tours that, and Jane's Walk is this week, and uh, also the Adventure Club, Untapped Cities, the Bowery Boys, many of our guides uh, have done have given tours for these uh, organizations, and a lot of, a lot of these tours were de developed here at Gannick as a part of an educational FAM offering. So, if you're giving a tour and you want to get it out of your mouth, or if you want to develop a tour, this is a, a great workshop for you with other guides who are very supportive and great audiences. So, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Education Committee does an amazing, amazing job. So we always, always appreciate it. And remember, yes, like Nina said, if you want to give a FAM tour, um, do check the website for the form to fill out so you can submit your ideas for a FAM tour and the Education Committee will get back to you. So um, our next is industry relations. So Mike, you're on. All right. So uh... You might all be sick of me by now. Sorry about yeah. that. But uh, in any event, this will be the last time you see me on screen today, uh, if you can see me at all. Um, so uh, I have a few things to get through tonight. It's funny, we, it seems like every uh, month that we have our meeting, right before that, New York City and Company is holding their meeting of the Allied Coalition for Tourism Recovery, which I uh, sit on uh, on Gannick's behalf. So I just wanted to go through a couple of um, items that came up today uh, and then uh, have some other, a few other things uh, to report. Uh, there were representatives from New York State who said that in a couple of weeks, uh, now that the budget has been passed, there's going to be an announcement of an $800 million grant program for small businesses. Most of that money is earmarked for businesses with less than 10 employees. Sound like anybody we know? Tour guides, right? So um, uh, Kelly Curtin said she will connect us with the proper state officials, and I'll uh, pass that along that information along to the government relations committee to uh, to further it. Uh, but I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, the state officials also reported that right now in New York State, 60% of adult New Yorkers have received at least one dose of the vaccine, and 45% are fully vaccinated. So as Emma said, if you haven't yet, please get vaccinated and encourage your friends to do so as well. Uh, there were reps from the MTA on the call as well. They're starting a new campaign called Take the Train or Take the Bus, depending on 
which is more uh, of your speed. And uh, it's gonna focus on discretionary travel as opposed to commuters. So uh, such as people going to take tours. So uh, keep uh, your eyes open for that. Uh, they mentioned also, I actually asked the question, I was curious. Uh, right now, 15% of subway rides are being paid by Omni, the new touch and go system. And in the next few weeks or months, they will be adding the seven day and 30 day pass options to Omni and they expect it to really explode at that point. So I haven't signed up yet, but I'm sure I will soon. Um, a couple other little blurbs that came up during the meeting. Uh, in June, the Hall of Gem Gems and Minerals at the Museum of Natural History will be reopening. So watch out for that. Um, Restaurant Week is coming back for in-person dining. They're gonna launch uh, promotions for it soon, July 19th to August 15th. Everybody was very excited about that. Uh, speaking of food, the Queen's Night Market will be having their pop-up at Rockefeller Center uh, again. Uh, and I think they're announcing that officially tomorrow. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the director of the Whitney Museum talked about a huge new project going up on the West Side by the great artist David Hammonds called Day's End. Uh, and it's uh, not in the museum, it's actually in the river next to Pier 52. And the opening ceremony or the dedication ceremony is May 17th. Sounds like that is uh, open to all, but I didn't really see any information on the Whitney website about it, but you can certainly check that out. Uh, now, a few other things to discuss. Uh, we talked a lot about Guide Week, but I do wanna thank all of the GANIC members who have volunteered in advance to help with, with Guide Week. So these people include, and if I leave anybody out, I apologize. I tried to get a list of everybody. Uh, committee co-chair, Bob Gilber, uh, Maggie Brown, Jerry Jastrub, Megan Galbraith, Miriam Barin, Adrian Cooper, Matt Apter, uh, plus board members, Kevin Lawrence, Jeremy Wilcox, Patrick Casey, John Semlack, Deborah Blau, and of course, our president, Emma Guest Gonzalez. Also, uh, industry partners, New York Adventure Club, Big Onion Tours, and Inside Out Tours are all serving as panelists, which is great. Uh, Emma mentioned at the top of the meeting that we are uh, hoping to return to in-person meetings in September. One quick note, because of Labor Day and Rosh Hashanah, the AGM, hopefully in person, will be Thursday, September 9th, because Rosh Hashanah is Wednesday, and we always like to have, to have this meeting after Labor Day, not before Labor Day. So it will be Thursday, September 9th, so keep your eyes peeled for more information about that. Uh, our industry relations co-chair, Bob Gilber, is going to be the one who's going to be facilitating all of our in-person meetings. So if you have suggestions on meeting venues and locations with contact names, not just, hey, let's meet at Madison Square Garden, um, it, email uh, industryrelations at gannick.org. Both Bob and myself see that email. So uh, if you have any suggestions, Bob can pick up uh, on that. Uh, a big thank you to Harvey Davidson. I feel like I say this every month, but he represented Gannick at the NISTIA conference, the New York State Tourism Industry Association conference. And he filed a very extensive report that will be contained in the minutes of this meeting. I'm not gonna read through the whole report, but it was pretty interesting, a lot about public, uh, publicity, how to generate publicity. This conference is targeted mostly at DMOs, but there's always information that's good for tour guides and tour operators. Um, Industry Partner Program, we're working out the final kinks uh, for the new Industry Partner page on GANIC.org. Once Guide Week is in the rearview mirror, that'll be the next big focus of, the, uh, of our committee. Uh, and then last but not least, um, I know many of you uh, who lead tours to the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island noted the recent acquisition of uh, the tour operator Walks, which is one of the bigger tour operators, daily tour operators to Statue and Ellis. Uh, they were acquired by Hornblower who operates the Statue of Liberty Ferry. Uh, and people are worried that this could lead to you know, exclusive access for them or limitations on other tour operators. Um, to date, and this is only a couple of weeks in, we have not heard anything that that is in the offing, but of course, who knows, right? Uh, we will monitor that uh, quite, uh, we will try to monitor it as closely as possible, uh, but I'll just tell you my personal feeling. Uh, you know that I was very involved in, and led in a lot of ways, the fight against the restrictions at the statue in Ellis a couple of years ago. Um, this fight, if it were to come, I don't think it's a fight that Gannick is going to be the leader on. I think this is gonna be more of a tour operator fight. And I encouraged two years ago, all the tour operators to start talking to each other to deal with the National Park Service. Uh, I think Gannick would happily sign on to any initiatives that they might have. Uh, but I don't think uh, this is, like I said, it's gonna be more of a tour operator fight than a tour guide fight per se. So uh, Gannick will certainly support our tour operator 
uh, friends and colleagues, uh, but I, at least at first blush, I don't know that this is a fight that Gannick is really gonna take the lead on, so to speak. But of course, if any of you guys hear anything about, anything in the leaves, anything whispers about what might be coming down because of this acquisition, please let us know so we can reach out to our sources and, and also try to uh, lobby before any decisions are made. Uh, and I think that covers just about everything I wanted to talk about tonight. So thank you so much and happy Cinco de Mayo. And come register for Guide Week. It's not yes. too late, register for Guide Week. Yes, register for Guide Week. Um, Kevin has a question. Uh, well, no, actually it's for another question, Mike. Can, uh, once we have in, this came from somebody else, but once we actually resume having in-person meetings, will there still be the streaming? So can you explain what the policy is going to be about when we resume having in-person meetings? That's a great question. I see it comes from our friend Joe down in DC. Hi, Joe, thank you for the question. Yes, so our plan, we had actually started live streaming our meetings prior to COVID. Uh, I don't know that we really did a great job of publicizing it that well, because I think we were working some technical kinks out, but now obviously we're all much more experienced in the space uh, of virtual meetings. So our plan is to continue to live stream them, perhaps not on Zoom. It might be a Facebook Live or something like that. So you might not be able to actively ask questions, not being uh, in person, um, but you'll certainly be able to view the meeting. And then of course, ask questions as follow-ups, if nothing else um, uh, of, committee, of the committee uh, chairs or the board members or, or things like that. We're still working out other protocols for who will uh, be eligible to attend meetings. And also a lot of that will depend on the protocols that the venues that we go to uh, have in place in addition to what the government uh, state and the city and the CDC dictate. So like everything else for the last year and a half, it's in flux a little bit, but uh, yeah, we do plan to live stream uh, all of the meetings and we still plan to have one meeting uh, every quarter be a virtual meeting on Zoom. That is our plan as well. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Joe. Yes, that is that is correct. Thank you, thank you, Mike. I'm bringing Derek on, but just to to reiterate, it's it's kind of all a moving target. We have to see what the city says, what the state says, what the venues policies are. But we, um, since you know, having the meetings also have a virtual being well, since they've been all virtual this entire time, we definitely want our meetings to have some kind of streaming or some kind of virtual component so people can participate like Joe who's down in DC and everybody can uh, can be included. So um, yeah, so just we'll, we'll keep you posted whenever we know anything. So Derek, um, if you would like to take over and give us your membership committee report, that'd be great. Thank you. Yep. Hi, everybody. It's Derek Chan, the membership committee chair. So first of all, as always, I just want to extend a special welcome to all of our viewers. So whether it's your first time or not, and whether you're a member or not, and wherever and whenever you happen to be viewing this, we're always glad that you're here. And as a reminder, I do want to mention that if you're not a member and are interested in becoming one, it is very easy to do so. Everything is done online. And to get started, you can just go to our website, gannick.org, and all details are listed uh, there. And in regard to that, Russ Norfleet, if you're out there, hello, um, please follow up with me. You can send me an email at membership at gannick.org. We do have one new provisional member who recently joined us, Brad Gauze. So welcome, Brad Gauze. We also do have a new full member, Joe Steinbach. As uh, Mike mentioned, he is uh, residing in the DC area. So welcome as a new full member. Currently our active GANIC membership is now 313. We have a total of 313 both provisional and full members in total. And also we will be ordering the next batch of the GANIC guide main badges uh, coming up. It's the badge that I'm wearing here. So if you don't have yours, if you haven't already paid, your name badge, uh, please do so uh, by this Sunday, May 9th, so that um, we can get that next order in, we can get your next order in as well. And I'm gonna put um, in the chat box here, the uh, website to go for that. You just go to the benefits page on the, the GANIC.org website, GANIC.org slash benefits uh, for that. And that's about it for me, unless there are any questions and you can always follow up with me later via email, membership at GANIC.org. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much, Derek. Um, that's great. And um, the I have a name badge. I'm not wearing it now, but I do have one. 
and I'm very proud of it. And I make sure I bring it with me whenever I'm doing an actual in-person tour. So I, sh I should probably start wearing it now when we're um, even for a virtual tour and <laughs> see what happens. So thank you, Derek. Um, that's great. And I put Derek's email is in the um, is in the chat if anyone needs to speak to him. And I'm going to bring Dave on. Okay, and I'll put Derek back as an attendee. Okay, so David, you should be all set. Okay, so Dave, go ahead. Um, seeing the uh, camera, oh, okay. Here we are. Hello. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dave, and I'm the editor of our newsletter, Guidelines. And uh, so welcome, everybody, to our organic meeting. Now, we are going to be revamping an old previous column. We will be resurrecting on a personal note. So if you'd like to uh, send in anything about that, I'll put in Linda Fisher's email in a moment, our very capable co-editor. And uh, pretty much just tell us about whatever you've got going on for you, uh, births or marriages or deaths in the family, graduations, anything like that. We're going to bring it back and resurrect it. And also Michael, Michael Morgenthal's very excellent guide week. If possible, I should like to have somebody write in about that. Doesn't have to be the whole dictionary, not a big uh, burden of your time, but a couple paragraphs and a picture, uh, you know, it'd be worth a good run in our next issue of, of our newsletter guidelines. So I'll be putting in the uh, email and that's about it for myself. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. Yes. And it's newsletter at gannick.org. <laughs> there, there you go. Well, so um, yeah. And all our, if you've missed, if you've ever missed an issue of guidelines, you can always see that they're posted in the documents on our website and there you get to see them in color. And so, um, yeah, so Mike asks, um, what, is the, what is the deadline for the newsletter for the next one? Excellent question. Well, the deadline has technically, uh, well, I will be happy to accept a good story on it a day or two or three after it's done. So if you want to just bang together something, uh, that would be, you, you'll get it in just in time. So the week yeah. after, so Guide Weekend's the 14th, so just like the, the like, couple days later like yeah that's out. tax week for me so i'm gonna be uh, spending a few plates at then <laughs> so okay. i don't need to hit, hit it with me the next day but within the next two or three days would just be very terrific great that would of course go for yourself as president uh, for your good column as usual okay i'll be ready i've got to think of something all right great thank you so much dave thank you so much all right so i'm going to um return to our board again. And so thank you all. Uh, are there any questions? I'm sorry. Um, are there any questions from any members? If you have anything to bring up in the chat, you're welcome to, to do so. And let me get rid of my Jeremy. Sorry. Yes, my cat. <laughs> I'm just, I'm so covered in fur right now. I'm glad the, the Zoom will not pick that up. So uh, a three hour tour. Um, not quite sure what Michael is referring to. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, so that's it. So a final reminder, register for guide week. It's going to be fabulous. You go into campfire, you set up your, um, set up your profile. Okay. And uh, then recruiters will see you. This is a really great flexible um, platform to use and you can, um, you know, put up photos, put up your CV, you know, resume, um, information about yourself and get your name out there. Um, as Mike said, there are going to be tour operators, there are online tour agencies, um, travel agencies, there are all sorts of things that will be there, sorts of organizations that will be there and they will be looking for guides. So get on to Guide Week. Um, Mike, what is the deadline? What is the last day people could register? Um, I don't know that we specifically have a deadline. I think you'll even be able to register after the fact to view the sessions because uh, they're going to be housed behind the paywall on, on Campfire. Uh, certainly, though, uh, if you're planning on participating in recruiting week, yeah, sorry, on the recruiting day, uh, I would register no later 
then Sunday, as long as you can get your profile up in that time as well. And I know some people have already filled out their profiles. It's gonna take you five, 10 minutes to fill out your profile. So don't just think, oh, I'll do this in 30 seconds. It, there's some pretty specific questions in there designed to make it uh, most efficient for the recruiters to find uh, the guides that they are interested in. So, uh, so I would say specifically, I, I would register by Saturday at the latest, but if you're more interested just in the sessions and not in the recruiting day, you can, uh, I think you'll be able to register whenever and view the, the recordings after the fact. Um, Kevin? Can you just remind us, Mike, how many recruiters? I think a lot of people want to know this. Uh, last count was 33. Um, but like I said, that's not tour operators exclusively. There's also OTAs and reservation technology companies and things like that. But we're still working to get a few more in. So, uh, and we'll, we'll, try, we'll try to get the names of that out this weekend. If not, it'll be published on Monday. Great. Well, it's going to be really, really um, a good a good couple days, and um, and we'll and we'll see what happens. And this is this is the first time it's happening, and this is for guides. Okay, this is you know Mike has been working on this literally day and night. So along with Mitch and along with Nikki, and then a whole group of volunteers and wonderful panelists who are donating their time and donating their energy and their expertise. So I I really I am hoping. You know, each and every GANIC member, you know, show up. You know, you guys, you, you're, you're, this is for you. And um, we really um, hope you're going to be there. Oh, Mike, you have one more thing. Uh, a question just came in from Jared uh, Goldstein about when resumes can be uploaded. Uh, and the answer is right now. Um, an email went out today. Anybody who's already registered for the conference should have received it today with instructions on how to log in and upload your profile. Uh, the email would come from the email address that I just posted in the chat, guideweek at travel campfire. Uh, sorry, it's not .com, it's .org. So let me put that in there again. Uh, so make sure that is uh, not going to your spam. And if you have any technical issues, you should email that email address, not industry relations, because uh, mm -hmm. that will go to Mitch who is doing uh, the, um, doing all the tech for us. So, uh, so yes, but now if you go, if you've already registered for guide week, you can go into the portal and you'll see the button that I showed in my screen share saying, uh, you know, fill out your profile, upload your resume. And yep. like I said, any technical issues, email guideweek at travelcampfire.org. Yeah, it's really pretty straightforward. You know, get yourself a nice profile picture, get a nice cover photo, you know, a couple of bells and whistles and make your profile really attractive and have other, um, so so recruiters will look at you and they'll be able to find you. So yeah, I, fi I filled mine out. It does take a, a couple minutes. You know, you want to do it carefully, check your spelling and, you know, don't be putting anything strange up there. And um, yeah, and then we'll see what happens. So thank you, everybody. Thank you everyone for attending this evening. Thanks again, Kevin, um, for such a wonderful, wonderful panel and for such an interesting time. And um, I think my son is actually making margaritas appropriately. So thank you, Georgina. So, That's a Georgina that we really yes. Oh, and Georgina, of course, of course, Georgina. Thank you so much. Um, I, I believe she's. Uh, I hope she'll be watching the recording of this. So thank you, Georgina, and thank you to all our panelists. So thank you, board. Thank you, members. We will see you at Guide Week starting Monday, um, 9.30. There's the early um, little sort of um, uh, opening sessions, and then it all starts at 10. So everybody, yes, be well. Enjoy the sunshine. I hope allergies aren't getting to people too, too much. And I'll see you all next week. So thank you so much, and um, have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Good night. See you next week at Guide Week. Bye.